Good afternoon. Anybody out there? I can't see with the lights. Well, welcome everybody to the O Canada panel. Uh, let's just do a quick show of hands. Uh, how many Canadians do we have in the room? <laughs> you guys are all creeping on the neighbors here. What's going on? How many curious Americans do we have? Oh, boys, we've got to build a wall. <laughs> we'll make them pay for it. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Uh, really, we wanted our group up here wanted to have a conversation as much amongst ourselves, but also with you guys. So if you have questions or if you have comments, just shoot your hand up. I think we've got a couple of mics in the room. Uh, so if you can uh, put your hand up if you've got a question or comment, go for it. It's a free-for-all. In typical Canadian fashion, we'll just apologize when we're done. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd, I'd like to introduce our panel today. I'll start from your right, coming back to your left. So Marcel Van Stavern. Marcel farms with his brothers uh, in and around the Creelman Fillmore area of Saskatchewan. How many people know where that is? Oh, one of you. Uh, Dallas Simmons farms with his family in the Hafford area. Blake Fredrickson uh, from Theodore, Saskatchewan. Provincial champs this last year in hockey. And Christian Hebert who farms uh, in and around Fairlight, Saskatchewan. So we've got a Saskatchewan panel here today. And we want to talk a little bit about not show and tell on their farms, but more get into how do you guys think? How do you make decisions? What are the things that bug you? And what are you doing about it? So we'll open up with some questions, but really it's, let's get some discussion happening. <coughs> Isn't technology wonderful? Nope. Okay, so we'll start out with some statistics first. Now, uh, when we compare the Canadian ag industry to the American, we haven't seen the precipitous drop in commodity prices. Really, we're being insulated by our, by our currency. But at the same time, as we're seeing our yields go up the last three years, we're seeing our expenses go up as well. And when you look at real farm income the last three years, it's flatlined. What's your strategy around, what are you doing with your farm to cope with this? So we'll start with Marcel. All right, I guess uh, overall I try to be an excellent risk manager and I, and I try to assess uh, all my options and tools from crop insurance to the private sector options and, uh, and I try to I try to predict my pitfalls and where I need to protect myself. We, we, um, so ultimately, I guess we're I'm, I'm pretty poor at it, or I can be poor at it. This year, we were so dry, I thought I was going to be set up for failure without any subsoil moisture, and it turned out to be a pretty good year. But uh, historically, it's been our strengths, and we've, uh, we've done other things to avoid. We stopped buying hail insurance, and that's one way to, that uh, with our land being spread out, we've, we've realized that uh, there's a risk factor there that kind of works out for us. And, and uh, so, so sometimes it's the things that I, we don't spend money on that uh, makes me excited. But um, um, yeah, overall we're, we're uh, I guess we'll leave it at that. Or what, what more did you want to it? That's fantastic. Anybody else cut out hail insurance the last couple of years or using alternative insurance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to talk about it a bit. <laughs> no, I haven't done hail insurance for yeah, quite a few years, I guess, just because of the cost of it. So I know the risk is there, but uh, I guess that's where some of the insurance programs that focus more on the bottom line protect against the disasters. I know, like, even the guys in the States were talking about health insurance costs, and I think a guy last night was saying, you know, sometimes taking higher deductibles, um, you know, take, be able to just absorb the small blows, but then protect yourself against the real heavy disasters, something that... Um, would really wipe you out, so maybe moving towards just protecting that way. Dallas, what did the last three years look like for your farm, and what are you doing about it? Uh, well, we're much the same. We're, I'm using multiple insurance companies to protect, but I would say to further that, we're, uh, I just make sure my staff are trained to like a, 
the highest level that I can possibly think so that there's zero mistakes. Because, I mean, one mistake can change, change your bottom line. So we just make sure that there's kind of a, a standard operating procedure. But it's not exactly like you would have with other companies, but as much as we can so that there is like down to zero mistakes, like everything's perfect. So try control to be what you can control. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, when it comes down to, it, I think the rising expenses are probably what's on everyone's mind. Um, like you said, I guess the net incomes flatlined rising expenses. So what are we going to do about that? I think I've focused more on timing, thinking about, well, when are we going to purchase these inputs, make sure that timing of purchases and sales are really where the margins have come to be because yeah, we're trying to push yields and we say, oh yeah, well, if we push yields enough, it'll cover those expenses. And I think that's a natural tendency is just, well, shoot for the moon and we'll be okay. Um, and I, I guess that's, you know, the other aspect of that is guys are just moving towards other crops, trying to find something that will work. Um, I'm sure that's what's going through a lot of people's minds. But uh, yeah, I think for me, it's timing comes down to it. Christian? I know we have trouble getting a word out of you sometimes, but... <laughs> My wife doesn't say that's a strength, but... <laughs> yeah, no, I <clears throat> mimic these guys. I mean, so top line will focus on maximizing the, you know, the utilization of our inputs for gross margin output. And, and I think, you know, we all, in Canada especially, we, we have a lot of field volatility. So we've really been focusing on taking that top 50, 60% of every field and you know, removing the handcuffs. I think that's maybe one thing we were doing is limiting the potential of the, the best part of our farm. So we've been focusing there on the, on the output side. Same thing as these guys. I mean, risk management plan set up so that we can't strike out. Worst case is a single, and then that allows us to, to go capture opportunities. But we've probably been focusing more on the, on the bottom side. So I mean, capital, capital utilization. And really, the issue in our cost structure is the fixed cost side of it. Because as revenues decrease because of whatever reason, uh, could be Twitter accounts and drama teachers, but <clears throat> um. <laughs> that's an inside Canadian joke. <laughs> you know, usually what happens is your your revenue or margin will start decreasing, but your fisc fixed cost structure takes three to five years to to fix. So, you know, we we captured as labor power machinery and land building and finance, but everyone does it their own way, and I think that. That you have to have some long-term planning in order to be pretty efficient on the on the fixed cost side, in order to handle the bumps in the road and, and have your risk management strategy set up to to be able to utilize the the fixed capital that you've got tied up. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. When I created this chart, uh, the story that's behind the story is that depreciation is what's eating up most of that net cash receipts, and so the cost of iron's going up and not at the same rate that uh, our revenues are going up. Like within some of the data that we're assessing on a couple other businesses, the, the average break even on a Canadian acre in about 2007 was 170 bucks. Right now, <coughs> we were joking about this at lunch, really it's about 350. There's, if your break even's 350-ish, it's probably telling the truth, and if it's not 350, you're just lying to yourself or don't know your numbers in most cases. But So it's doubled in, in, a, matter of, in a matter of 10 years, and the, the issue is is that factor factor of labor power and machinery, so wages, leases, depreciation, fuel, the cost to get it done. The old benchmark four or five years ago would have been eighty dollars an acre. The new benchmark's probably one twenty five. The average is more like one thirty five. So I mean our, our labor power and machinery costs are almost what our old break evens were ten years ago. Well that leads right into this. When you're running these multi-million dollar operations. What keeps you up at night? And don't say your wife. <laughs> if you do, you're probably lying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or, or the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, why don't we start in the middle? Dallas, do you want to go first? Um, you know, not too much keeps me up at night. I don't sleep that much, so when I lay down, but the only, the only fat thing that I think about sometimes is, is if something happened and I needed to exit, um, it scares me a little bit that there's no one around that could, uh, well, it, currently that would buy me out. Like it would take years to piece out. And that's the only, that's the only thing that really worries me. My wife talks about it a lot, so. Or, or if I just wanted to quit. 
there's there, right now I'm, there's no way out. So other than that, everything's just fun. That's a unique problem of probably the large acres. It's maybe something that some people aren't thinking about. But as farms are rationalizing and getting larger, it does become, you know, what is your exit? Well, yeah, there isn't one right now. There isn't, there isn't, there is no exit. So, I don't know. I'm sure maybe there will be something, like something will uh, come, but I, right now there's no, there is no exit. And I mean, I'm not saying I want to exit, but if I had to, there's no way out. Should explain that for the couple Americans in the room. So, like in Saskatchewan, it's illegal for foreigners to own land within the province. It has to be, it has to be held by Canadian residents. So the, and the exiting of our operations is a lot, the, the limit is, is that when the capital gets too high, there's a lot less people that, that are able to do it. Now, it's also catch 22, because it probably kept our land prices where they were up till a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. Till the farm bidding war. But uh, on the other side of it for retiring farmers or anyone that, that wants to exit, it really limits options especially when you get to the numbers, you know, that it costs to buy out big acres now. Uh, we have one question from the crowd. Just, go, just going back to your, uh, your original comment about farm incomes being insulated from the Canadian dollar versus uh, what the Americans are dealing on an, at par dollar with our commodities being marketed around the world. Who on the panel has a direct hedge on the Canadian dollar, be it through futures or through options? And if you... If you do, how much are you hedging at a time of your gross sales for your farm? And if you don't, why don't you have something protecting what was presented at the beginning of the presentation as the only thing that's protecting our farm economy? I think the tough part with that, like you can run a hedge on the Canadian dollar, but the size you might have to margin to do it, depending on the size of your operation can, you know, you can have cash flow constraints to holding it long enough that you, um, because the difference in the move in the price we would see uh, mostly through basis versus uh, move in the dollar, you know, so basically what I'm saying is you can have a sudden move in the Canadian dollar that requires a large amount of margin in your hedge account to hold that and the basis will move much more slower. So if, it, if the trade goes against you, it's, it's going to be tough to hold in my opinion. I guess that we look at it, we got uh, some of our crops are IP crops, so direct contract, we don't have to worry about the currency on those crops. I think the biggest thing too now is, I mean, there's no question you have to split basis and, and futures when you're, when you're marketing grain, because depending on what crop we're in, don't ask me why basis, wheat basis has got currency calculation in it instead of futures, but you got to split that and then, yeah, so we carry about a 50% hedge, 50% currency hedge on the the crops that aren't contract. Okay, great. So on your 50% uh, currency hedge, you would say you, then you'd be long the futures on the Canadian dollar right now? So kind of well, what your idea is? So if, say if I got canola that's, if, especially if we've moved on the basis already, then we'll hedge the currency on the future side. Right. So okay. it depends on which crop. Yep. But yeah, we'll take a position on the on the futures at the right. same time, depending on what we've done with basis. Right. Yeah. Bunch of dumb farmers, eh? <laughs> Marcel, what keeps you up at night? Well, it's probably you know in the last thirty years, any land that we've bought, we would it was thirty to fifty thousand dollars a quarter, and we could usually grow forty to sixty thousand uh, dollars worth of crop every year. So we didn't have to be as smart as Christian to figure out how this works. It, it worked. We we're excellent farmers. We did a lot of work on our research and. How to how to stay current and be uh, take advantage of technology and and now we're paying two hundred to three hundred thousand a quarter and we're not uh, grossing that uh, in our revenues so maybe get up to hundred some years and so anyhow so we have another opportunity to buy some more land and we're going through that right now and my son is buying a couple of the quarters and and he's just kind of looking at me and saying well dad is it going to work and it's like yeah it's going to work but uh, you might be looking to me for a few, actually, the odd year because we're not going to probably make enough uh, certain years there's gonna be some tough ones of course and so uh, so yeah, it's it's kept me up at night this uh, this winter there's been opportunities and we're seizing one of them and and uh, every year we we expand and take on more so but it's never bothered me as much as this year as we're getting to loftier levels which uh, for some of you 250 a quarter is a is an old number but it's a it's a new one for us and there's some oil service leases in there as well that inflates that number even more but uh, anyhow 
it just we have all these factors coming against us here in the near term. Maybe a carbon tax if some of you vote that other guy back in again, and and uh, and uh, interest rates, etc. So there's a lot of a lot of factors, squeezed margins. So Blake, you're the one thick or mixed farmer that's on the panel. Uh, what keeps you up at night other than calving cows? Well, I think what keeps me up at night is more real broad range stuff that we don't have control of. Um, currently public perception of agriculture is one of them. You know, the fight against lawsuits uh, against round for roundup damage, um, the neonics coming up, and also, I guess, a public perception of GMOs. You know, so there's a lot of tools re we rely on, and I think that's the thing that, um, how to take those large issues and then bring them back <coughs> down to trying to plan what you're gonna do on the farm in the future. Um, I think I struggle with that more so than, than the stress, other stresses. Christian? Well, probably the main thing is I got a four-year-old daughter talking about boyfriends at 16 already, so <coughs> that would keep me up the most. But from a business standpoint, um, yeah, I mean, I, I got a long-term goal that I think the two biggest risks in agriculture are political and currency. And so I rack my brain a fair bit trying to figure out you know, how to have those hedged off or, or locked off by the time my kids or the next generation wants to take over the farm. And that, you know, that means going outside the box on looking expansions to other countries or, you know, different types of things. Um, but the last part of it is, is the political risk of it. You know, we're so split up as farmers. There's so many of us. We don't, we don't really have a voice. And that's part of the reason we lose some of these battles. So how do we how do we get enough influence within the, wor like within the world of agriculture so that when a dumb decision is going to be made, at least somebody in this room got a phone call to put some input on it? Because a lot of that stuff is getting pushed through 20-year bureaucrats to a two-year politician that's you know, worried more about getting elected than knowing anything about, the, about our industry. So, and you look at the oil fights right now, which aren't going that well, and they have the, the Brad Walls and the Brett Wilsons that can get on BNN the next day and basically counteract a political thing and, and reach we, we don't have that in agriculture. Yeah, and I think, like, uh, like Christian is saying, without that voice too, um, there's a lot of these groups out there that have financial backing that simply agriculture, we haven't really invested in that. You know, so you've got groups that are running $10 million budgets just for legal and publicity, right? Um, so uh, along with that voice, I guess, yeah, like whether or not as a group we need to be moving towards even a financial backing to be able to f fight our fight and when it comes down to it, right? At the start, I talked jokingly about building the wall, uh, but I've met a lot of farmers around the world, and they all face the same problem. Uh, they get down to currency risk, they get down to political risk, and we're divided in agriculture. So it's that's what FBN is about, is trying to put it together, give everybody the information so that you can make the decisions based on the group contributing. So that's my shameless plug for FBN, if you, if you didn't notice. Okay, Christian, you get your wish. You get to be king for the day of agriculture. What are you gonna change about our industry? <laughs> See, it must be a tough one. Okay. So that first of all, it'll never be allowed because I'm too right wing. So it would probably go too far, right? Hence why Trump said he'd build the wall just to scare everybody and then they'll figure their shit out halfway through. But a um, couple things, I guess. So I'm a, I'm a big believer that government should just be a referee. They should never play in the game. And there's way too many parts of our industry that, that government thinks they should play. Um, they highly affect how financing is done in agriculture. They're they got their fingers in every piece of the insurance game in agriculture that really does limit the entrepreneurial spirit. So that would be point one. Point two, I would uh, I take the industry of, of banking and make them understand that, you know, volatil vol volatility and EBITDA, which is what they want to lend on in every other industry other than agriculture, doesn't mean that we should only have to take loans out on, on land equity. Um, so I think the utilization of different types of financing methods and and freeing up some cash would not only help the entrepreneurs within the industry flourish, it would also really make some of these succession type 
mentality is doable because you have all this all this equity tied up that's levered that doesn't need to be levered on fairly profitable farms. Live poor, die rich. Yeah, exactly. Blake? Yeah, I'm, I was thinking I'm with Christian on the fact that the first um, thing I would do is just more protection for, you know, the lawsuits and the political risk out there. Um, of course, you'd have to be king of agriculture for a day to actually get it through. So um, that way something is there to say you don't have to be facing all these legal challenges or battles, um, especially without the science behind it. Um, so that protection would be in place. Um, I think that's what I would aim for. We had a question at the back of the room. Yeah, hey guys. Um, just uh, to sort of touch on a point that Christian just made there. Uh, you were talking about lending on EBITDA, and uh, I, I mean, I think everybody in the room is probably, if you don't know what that is, it's a very scary thing in your operation. It should be something that everybody watches, but do you have any ideas of of what would it be an alternative then? Because like FCC's got like the Young Farmer Program, and really like what they're offering up isn't even like enough to put a dent in how to build an operation today, right? Um, any ideas on how to get outside of the box on that? Yeah, so there's, uh, if I just, like I'll use our operation as an example. We Our operating line's bank backed 100% by our risk management contracts. So however we decide to stack our insurance, we now have a minimum margin and our, our operating line is just 100% the insurance contract and a personal guarantee. It doesn't use any land or machinery equity up to about 290 bucks an acre. Um, so, and if we expand, the op line just goes up by 290 bucks an acre. It doesn't use any of the other equity. Um, and there's, getting a, there's a couple of companies in Canada that are starting to look at it right now. Um, I, Global Ag has their own bank for that reason, but it's not because they want one. It's because that hopefully the other banks pay attention and get their head out of their ass. Uh, but a brand new one in the US, Farm Op Capital, just raised 300 million three and a half weeks ago one of their founders is born and raised Weyburn, Saskatchewan, actually, and uh, they got 2.2 billion for next for 2020 crop, and it's all going to be backed by by insurance contracts. So I mean, the way you lend on EBITDA in agriculture is to prove that it doesn't have to be volatile. So you know, in order for us to get that type of lending, we have to show that we can have some net income stability, and and we have to have ways to back those loans. And that's a pretty easy way to say that that crop that's growing isn't worth zero. That crop that is growing is worth whatever my worst case scenario is, and I already know my, I know my worst case scenario. So, there's there's methods coming. It's just, I mean, the the slowest moving industries in the world are agriculture, insurance, and banking, and we need the three of them to talk to each other. Um, and I, and I'm not saying that rudely. I mean, like we went, you know, we went from GP left from no GPS to light bars to GPS to auto steer. But if you take what tech has done to most other industries. Insurance banking and agriculture are still a long ways away from the speed of change that a lot of other industries are having to deal with. We had another question on the right side of the room. Uh, well, it's back to what keeps you up at night. Uh, like I'm fourth generation farmer. We've saved and worked that many years to ha own land. I, I don't think land has the necessarily going to keep up to inflation and I think inflation is going to be rampant coming forward so like do you do you agree that that we're living on a really fine line and if the land prices cannot just keep doing what they're doing because it, there's no common sense to say that it will keep up to inflation you buy a piece of machinery there's common sense in there that it will go up because there's there's more labor and, uh, and so and so but like that that's the scariest thing about losing our wealth and for like in the stock market, you could lose it, but you didn't work all. You didn't work three generations, really, of hard labor to get there. Like, you, you have Like, it's it's just uh, my thinking. But do you have any comments to that? Yeah, like you're kind of saying whether or not land is even a good investment. I mean, quite often it's said that uh, it's never a good investment, and other people say it's always a good investment. <coughs> um, and especially, I I know what you're saying is it. It adds a lot of stress, a lot of risk because of the amount of time you've worked to acquire it, right? I guess we're all seeing that in agriculture too because 
um, as we're multi-generational, you're, you're saying, and that goes back to the lending thing, is that how does a person actually just come from a city and say, okay, I'm going to go out and start farming, right? Um, to actually have that financial backing to do it and then the risk involved. And, and you're right, what if you buy land and it actually does sink? I think in the long term, we all know that obviously there's profit in farming over the long term because you can see it as our farms are growing. Um, and you have to just hang in there and um, have a balanced approach probably in what you're investing in your land versus your other capital. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I guess kind of the approach we've taken is kind of run under the assumption we have two businesses, right? We have a real estate business and our real estate holdings just happen to be land, not hotels, but it's the same type of theory. You want to improve your real estate and you want to have a high occupancy rate. And then we have an operating business that needs to run, you know, a lot more levered at a, at a higher rate of return. So, but it kind of goes back to this theory of the only way to get financing in agriculture is your land. Because, and then what we do is we shoot ourselves in the foot. We keep it levered to keep expanding or to do the next thing instead of, instead of diversifying in order to offset some of the risk of a land downturn because we wouldn't be as worried about it if we had investments in other areas. Now, you might choose to invest it all in your farm or all in land or that's your decision, but usually it's because there isn't enough cash flow due to the way we finance Canadian farms in order to make those decisions. But no, I, I mean, I agree with you completely on land. <clears throat> the last few interest rate hikes, I mean, you start seeing, I'll use Southeast Saskatchewan, wheat canola rotation, land trading at 2,000 bucks an acre at a 5% interest rate. I mean, you can't, $100 an acre rent plus doesn't work real well at 1050 canola and, and seven and a quarter wheat. Now, what's gonna happen with inflation and interest rates? I mean, I think if we could all figure that out, we probably wouldn't farm. We just live in Hawaii and trade the currency and trade the market. But, uh, but it's definitely something that I think all producers need to shock their, shock their balance sheet. So if interest rates go up 2% or land values drop 25%, what position does that put you in with your lender and your, <laughs> and your wife maybe? Right? <laughs> Dallas, you're king for a day. What do you change about this industry? Uh, probably, you know, much the same as Christian. I would, uh, well, the first thing I would change is the farm ownership rule that it would be open to worldwide, not just North America. And the second, I would just take all political handcuffs off because we, uh, I'm lucky I get to work pretty closely with the SAS party and, and Premier Mo. I, um, the sad part is, is I'm involved in a lot of the decision making, but they rarely listen because it would be unpopular. It, it would be right, but it's unpopular. And everything's about votes. And like I say, very rarely is a, a good decision made. It's always about a vote. And so I would, I would try to change that. So. Marcel, you're a closer on this one. Just before I, I, I address my king of the day uh, vision, I want to just, just answer on the, on the land thing. And uh, I guess part of my background for, for 10 years, I was an owner in an ag chemical retail business in Southeast Saskatchewan. We had a couple stores. We joined venture with Cargill after uh, three years in the business. And so, so I had a lot of great opportunities to sit around a board table with, let's say, Len Penner, who at the time was president of Cargill for Canada. And he was a, he was a guy that instilled a lot of good values in us and, and to this day about uh, whether any kind of business expansion for Cargill had to be a standalone decision on its own, on its own opportunity or merit. And so all my life I've been able to try to live by those, some of those guiding principles that say when you meet a guy like that. And this is the first time with me for this, these land values that I'm stepping out of that box and trying to putting it in a melting box uh, or in a, in a melting pot rather and saying, well, I guess my land average price is now this. It's not 250 a quarter, but it's, uh, it's a lot less than that because I put it in this melting pot, which is against some of my, my early teachings. But uh, so I'm a little bit embarrassed about that. But uh, anyhow, it's, uh, I guess at this stage of my life, I can do it. <laughs> We're in the world way. of social media. Everybody knows now, Marcel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so king of the day, I'm, I'm going to go to agronomics, I guess. And uh, it really seems that the seed business is closing in on us as farmers uh, to, to a point. And I'm kind of happy to see what FBN is doing here in the, on the U.S. side and opening up some older varieties and bringing them forward that are somewhat comparable or maybe, uh, maybe very comparable. I don't know. Um, you know, we all have the, those unique situations. You get a hailstorm. 
June the 5th and you gotta replant June 10th and it's like, gee whiz, I wanna spend $73 an acre on a canola seed or maybe there's a legal, uh, you know, much cheaper option than, we, we don't really have too many options on the old uh, legal bin run canola varieties and, and or something of that, uh, you know, down to those kind of values. And so I'm excited, we've been growing some old RR1 technology in, uh, in soybeans, we're almost like Argentinians for the last six years growing these older soybean varieties and the price spread just isn't there for the new technology. Um, and all of us are looking at this new tech, new, new sea change with, uh, with uh, royalties for if you choose in the future to bin run your uh, cereals, let's say. And I, and I want to, you know, I want to grow the greatest uh, varieties and I want to plant them in general, but there are always opportunities when maybe I want to dumb it down, whether it's a market downturn or other, other things. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, the whole seed business and, and it feels like it's closing in on us and I, I, I don't like that feeling and I'm hoping for uh, things to open up again on on all aspects of our expenses, but. Yeah, we had a question over here. Yeah, so just wondering, you guys, um, roughly, like first question, two questions. First one, roughly, what would you guys be paying per acre in Saskatchewan right now um, uh, for great, good land or average land? Well, we were just talking about that ten or yeah, five minutes it, before. It seems like it's all over it, the ballpark. Yeah, I'm the lucky guy in the lower it's priced land area, but I guess everything, it, we all know it's highly variable because if, you, if you're if you touching one quarter on three sides, you know, you're gonna pay more for it, you always have that. Um, and then I know like in our area, we have such variability. So I mean, you might be willing to pay almost anything for one quarter and then just a mile down the road, you're not even interested. Um, but yeah, I guess generally speaking, yeah, how would you guys pencil that? I think out? we had the range, right? The 1,200 to 4,000 an acre for cropland. On but this it's, panel. That's but highly variable on the crop mix. So, I mean, the, some of that, usually more of the high price land is in the pulse country where pulses were on a basically a 10 year swan song until the last two years. And that really ran up some of the land prices in those areas. But it's really volatile based on the land quality because, you know, you'll have right from quarters that only get 70 acres seated on them, the quarters that are 160 wide open tabletop. So that it is very variable throughout the province. Oh. Just in the past 12 months, it's been 1,000 to 1,700 an acre for ownership and rentals typically been 35 to $50 an, an acre in my, my area. Yeah, I'd say I'm bang on with Marcel and kind of guys I've talked to, land that changed was 1,200 bucks an acre. I guess that leading to my next question, if you guys had to pay an average of 3000 to $4,000 an acre, at what point, or have you guys ever thought if you had to pay that, is there a profit left for you guys? Well, I think it brings up other questions like the fellow back there was talking about his, you know, fourth generation farmer, you've got all this land, and then we're all invested for, I mean, good times to keep coming, whether it's, you know, land and production and, um, when we talk about currency hedges, uh, very few of us are, are invested for a possible downturn, recessions, that sort of thing. It's something we normally don't look for. So I guess right away, if I start saying, okay, I'm gonna pay $3,000 an acre, I start thinking, okay, if I was looking at this from the real estate investment side, like Christian was saying, he's got two parts of his business, the real estate side and then your operational side, um, you start to question, well, should I be doing something different with this portfolio if I'm going to be investing. Like, really, how, how important is that land to, to my operation? Um, and I mean, we can all justify everything. So you can say, well, based on land I've owned for 30 years, this factored in is a very much small part. Um, I guess it, there's so many different approaches to it, right? Um, but no, three or $4,000 an acre, it doesn't make sense. No, there's no not, money left. It's not going to. And I mean, if you went to rent it out if you, at 5%, you're never going to get a return. You're going to be looking at one or two, so there's, it's definitely not a good idea. The one metric I've seen <clears throat> that can work you know, reasonably well to compare kind of worldwide farmland is if you take gross margin, so just yield times price minus seed, fertilizer, chemical, leaves you with gross margin. It's kind of the same on every farm in the world. Take that number on, and of course, you got to average it on a three-year average or whatever, but take that divided by land price per acre, and if that number is under 10%, nobody's making any money. If it's over 10, so I mean, if, at that investment rate, if it's 15, 16, 17, I'm buying land all day.
But if it's sub 10, so I mean on that, on that stuff you just said, right, <clears throat> 3,000 bucks an acre, you'd want to you'd wanna be able to know that over the time that you're probably going to pay for that land, you want your gross margin to be over 300 bucks an acre. There are not many farms in Saskatchewan that can average over a $300 an acre gross margin on a long, like on a five and a 10 year average. So they just physically, physically can't even pay for it, let alone make it pencil. Thank you. Most farmers will have 40 crops in their career in that ballpark. And I know none of you are farming the same way that you did last year or farming the same way that you did 10 years ago. When you look at your approach to the year, trying new technologies, what have you, how do you approach making the decision, do I take on that technology? How do I incorporate that into my farm? Why don't we start with you, Christian? Yeah, so I guess I like the movie Moneyball. Anyone in the room watch Moneyball? Yeah, so I mean, <coughs> theory of that was, was is you don't have a lot of a budget and you want to use data analytics to make as much money as you possibly can, i.e. win the World Series. So that's kind of the focus we're taking on technology is how is this letting us analyze data or gather data at a quicker rate to make good decisions? And kind of the theory is, is if we're in a money ball decade, then we just want to turn our farm into blackjack farming. So if that data is showing me that the dealer's got a six and I got a king, <clears throat> as long as our risk management plan's good, we're probably going to double down. And if, you know, the dealer's got a king and I got a six, well then we're going to change our assessment based on the data that we're pulling, which is no different than the soil probes that that Marcel's talking about. So some of the tech is, you know, we're, now we got soil probes going down four or five feet in the ground and, and measuring soil moisture and how that's going to go. But I think that's maybe how we're trying to work our way through the differences in decision making because really it is mainly tech. And then, uh, yeah, we just got an annual, obviously our annual expense is just on a budget that we set for tech, but how we're assessing tech is, is tied to that money ball decade blackjack kind of theory. Dallas, how about you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know much the same. I, I mean, I guess I, operational changes. Basically, the first thing I'm looking at is how I think I can implement them with my staff first. That's why lots of times I won't be first to the, you know, ball game for new technology. I, when you have a large staff, it's a little harder to uh, just, you know, s jump in and out of things. You slowly incorporate and... Like I say, I'm, I'm a real anal about having everything done perfect. So, um, yeah, basically, if I think my staff can take it on, then um, that's basically how I, how I make most of my decisions. Marcel? Yeah, I guess I kind of thought about internal or external opportunities in, if, within our, our operation. And uh, from an internal one, I've got two nephews that recently joined our farm. And one has a diploma in agriculture. The other one just finished his degree. And... So I'm, I'm looking to them to, uh, to help pick up some of the agronomic uh, things. But, I, you know, I have discovered, and I don't want to throw them under the bus. They're, they're far from here. But Did it's you like, ever think that you'd be the old guy on the farm? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not 50 yet. Just <laughs> about three more days, I'll be 50. So I thought last night I could outlast the other guy I was with, but he, we both uh, were done pretty early. But so, so we, uh, <laughs> um, they were flashing the lights, so. But anyhow, so, so from an internal perspective, I was, uh, you know, we want to empower our, our young guys and, and uh, try to add extra responsibility towards them. And, and uh, from external opportunities, it's, it's some of these apps that we, we can have. I'm, you know, interested in this FBN uh, uh, software and some of the things that uh, data we can plug in there and better analyze some of our results and, and what, we're, uh, what we've done in various fields and comparing at a field-by-field -field basis. And, Ultimately, we're, we're trying to do things better and more finer. And again, whether it's the probe or, or uh, managing by soil zones, we have five zones across all of our fields, and we need to do a better job. And it's probably as those sixty percent where we uh, have the, the best acres to try to drive more out of them. And that's probably what's showing up in my results uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, it's those internal and external opportunities. Blake, I I'd, I'd have to say that take kind of a holistic approach to it where you're looking at kind of a, the whole big picture long term um, and that way when you're incorporating those annual changes so you're looking at next year uh, for example let's say okay we're joined on to FBN now and we're looking at utilizing this data then if I'm starting to make changes uh, you know through say screens and storing data from sprayer seeders um, 
so once I'm making that change, but there's, there's a purpose behind it and a bigger picture going on, um, something we're moving towards. And of course, wrapped in that FBN data might be the fact that we're driving towards more efficiency. So kind of taking a bigger approach than drilling it down and then using experience to say, yeah, we can actually bring this in or we've seen changes in, in the last 10 years that we brought them in this way, they've worked. Um, and you kind of get that gut instinct that, yep, this is the year to do it, right? Question in the back. Yeah, um, we had a question back here for how much of your annual budget or what percent of your budget um, do you spend on tech every year for each of you guys? Spend on what, sorry? On technology. That's a good question. I guess the, the one problem, right, is what, what are you defining as technology? So is it, like, do you want everything from variable rate to soil probes to, and then the other part is, is a lot of the tech we spend on, right, is in the newer, in the equipment we're buying and what percentage of that equipment is tech? So I mean, if I, we, have a, we use about a $12 an acre investment number, which includes everything from soil test to variable rate to the soil probes to the, some of the different type of tech sensors, et cetera, we're using to grow the crop. But that doesn't include you know, the GPS bubbles and the screens and stuff in the, in the equipment. But that's, our, that's kind of our number on. And it, our normal number is about 10 to do everything we want to do from an agronomic precision standpoint. So it leaves us a little bit of a buffer for trying out some new stuff every year. I don't yeah. know if that means anything. I'd agree with you. It's, it'd be about that $10 mark. Um, I mean, that's where then you have to pick and choose sometimes what you're, you're going to, I guess, spend it on, right? Obviously, if you've got to buy some screens or in this case, if we're going to work with more data, um, say through FBN, and then we're going to be updating monitors and more equipment, that might mean something else has to go for, for the time being, right? Because that's our focus now. Seems like ten. Sorry, Dallas. Seems like like ten dollars an acre is very close to our, our numbers as well. And and you know it, it, it's surprising how many. I guess for me it seems to be twenty one thousand dollars. Everybody that uh, phones me has something for us to improve our operation, and it's about twenty one thousand dollars. It's about a dollar an acre, I guess. But uh, so. So it's, uh, but we have some of those pieces, and, and uh, but more so in the, on the managing the fertility, and, and uh, ultimately that's our, we, we all know in this room, it's our, uh, it's, our, it's our foundation and managing our soils optimally, and, and that's where the first focus goes, but we have a few other extra pieces from weather stations, so what have you. I think the one thing, too, to remember, like, when we go through all this, so I mean, we all talk about tech, but Dallas going back to his crew, I mean, I think all of us up here that even though we embrace technology, I mean, the number one thing is people. Ideas, you know, ideas might create GDP or might create an economy, but execution is GDP. So if you can't execute, it don't mean anything. And so, you know, we, as soon as we got on the stage, we were talking about how many full-time guys and how many people per acre and how many hours per acre and those type of metrics. And then, because it goes right back to the fact of, you know, we spend all this time, like we'll nickel and dime, we're farmers, right? So we'll nickel and dime on who's paying for supper. And yet if we make one bad decision, it makes Harvard look cheap. Right? Like, I piss away a Harvard education at least twice a year. <laughs> if I had a crystal ball. So, the, and, then, and then the more people you get working for you, the more people you need to make decisions, more like you want them to. So what is, what is your method to SOPs? And same thing as Dallas. I mean, like this millennial work, and I am a millennial, so I can call them a pain in the ass, but it's a different group of people to work with than, than what we're used to and how do you get them both to work. And an SOP might simply be an iPhone video of how to put a prescription in a monitor. And, but really, the, the big thing on this tech and data is how much do you believe in it? So if, you're, if all your yield monitors go down, like have you ever calibrated them? If the grain cart scale's done, do you just keep combining or are you going to fix it? Because like, if you don't have it, the data is worth nothing. And if it's crappy, I mean, shitty data probably is shitty decisions. So that, to me, that's the biggest jump we have to make on this is one, we got to get good data. And then two, we actually got to get it in a form we can make a decision good data in a binder that sits on the corner of my desk to hold my coffee cup isn't that good. Right, so. Yeah, and it's like you say, Christian, I mean, garbage in, garbage out, right? So um, once you're going towards having that data, utilizing it, then you've got to have good data. Otherwise, it's pointless. All right. Well, I, are there any one, we have like two minutes. Are there any last questions? Has I piss away two Harvard educations a year made it to Twitter yet? <laughs> I'm just thinking I made a I played 
I played uh, chicken on a malt barley contract last year. It might have cost me three. <laughs> <laughs> well, join me in thanking our panel. Thanks a lot, guys. That was great.